and welcome to Veterans Remember. I'm Dick Gooding, your host of Veterans Remember, a series of conversations with Hopkins veterans who have served our country during wartime and in peace. In our discussions, we hope to share with our viewers some of the experiences of our veterans who served during World War II, Korean conflict, the wars in Vietnam, the Gulf, Iraq, and currently in Afghanistan. They share with us their personal stories and the impact their service has had on their own lives as well as on the lives of all of us today. I'm joined today by Ron Remillard, an Army Signal Corps veteran and a longtime resident of Hopkinton. Ron, I'd like to welcome you to uh, Veterans Remember. Dick, thanks for having me. Uh, first of all, I'd like you to uh, uh, tell us a little bit about your youth and where you grew up and, uh, and uh, a little bit about your decision to go to the service. Sure. Actually, I wasn't, I wasn't born in Hopkinton or raised in Hopkinton. I was raised down on the South Shore in a town called Middleborough. My father, he was a millwright, and my mom was at home. And the reason that I entered into the service was because that we actually couldn't afford uh, college. My father told me that uh, he couldn't afford to send me. The school I did want to go to was RIT up in uh, Rochester, but that was uh, very expensive and certainly out of the reach. So what I found out was that the Army made uh, some type of promises that said if you enlist, then we'll put you into a vocation, something that you will be able to use in the civil civilian life. So what I did is I joined the Army, number one, mainly because of that promise. Number two, it was a three-year commitment. Um, my brother also served in the Navy. He went into the same type of commitment, but in the Navy it was a six-year commitment. And um, from there, I, uh, once I joined, I ended up going to um, Fort Dix for basic training, as just about everybody did in the New England area. Was there an original uh, initial commitment, uh, Ron, to uh, Signal Corps where you ultimately wound up, or was that? Right. I, they, they originally, originally, they said that um, what, what uh, I was originally scheduled to go into a, a course called uh, Fixed Crypto, which was the repair of the cryptographic machines, but they were fixed. They were stationary. I got, I got a call from the recruiter, and he said um, that he could get me into a Another course called General Crypto, which was the field crypto machines, it was a, it required eight week longer school, which put me in from a 24 week school into a 32 week school. Now that's 32 weeks of electronic training. And uh, military schools are very intense. You don't, you don't go to your class and get something and go home. You go to school, you go to school for eight hours a day. And um, it's, it's very intense. The had, you had, fact, the had you had technical training back no, in high school or anything no, like I that? No, I took the aptitude test, and the aptitude test showed that I was very strong in the technical area. And so they decided that they put, would put me into that. One of the things that, that once I took the testing, you, we took a, you take about a day and a half worth of testing when you go to Fort Dix. But in the testing, I, I scored very high in learning a foreign language. And they, they, they asked me, they said, would you, would you like, to go to the, like to go to the language school? And I said, um, right there, I said, I didn't want to, I said, you know, what would I learn? And they said, well, Russian or Chinese. And I said, you know, I thought to myself real quickly, I said, well, where would I be using that? <laughs> and uh, so I decided, I said, no, I said, I think I'll, I declined and I, I stuck, with my, stuck with my guns. Completed 10 weeks of basic training at Fort Dix. And then from there, I was um, sent, uh, well, sent home. We all go home. Everybody gets two weeks of leave, uh, which is wonderful after completing that rigorous routine. But then from there, I went to uh, Fort Monmouth, New Fort Jersey. Fort Monmouth, instead of going out to Monterey for language school, huh? Right, the Presidio, actually, it was, yeah, <laughs> oh, for language school. Yeah, and actually, the language school was one year. Yeah. Yeah, you had, it was a one-year one year, uh, commitment uh, to, to learn the languages. But mm. anyway, I stuck stuck to my guns. I went to the electronics school uh, at Fort Monmouth. Uh, excuse me, I'm just going to look at my notes here. Um, so once I got into the, uh, once I got into the cryptography uh, area, the, the actual machines, well, one of the things was that was interesting is that you had to get a security clearance. I, I would, you know, in order to enter the school, into the enclosed areas of the school, I required a, um, a secret Crypto, uh, secret clearance with crypto access. I was almost denied. And really? Why, yeah, why was I, that? I couldn't believe it. Well, they had me down. The, the government, ev ed evidently the FBI, you know, I guess that's father, brother, and I. I don't know, but anyway. They decided that, they found that I was 
found guilty of being drunk and disorderly in Worcester, Massachusetts. And I got called in and they said, you know, I'm sorry, but you're not going to be able to complete, you're not be able to go into the school and I, when we got an explanation I says well you better go a little bit further I says I've never been the only time I was ever in Worcester Massachusetts was on a bus ride coming back from Amherst and I says that was it so they dug a little bit deeper it was a Ronald F. Remillard he was born in December of 1942 but it was Ronald Francis Remillard my name is Ronald Forrest Remillard isn't that something? so that was something <laughs> so that almost kept me out of the school but that's the one thing about that crypto school was it had a very high fallout. Uh, we would graduate, you know, if you started with, say, 24 uh, enlistees, you would, you would end up with about 12. And um, so, but I, com I, completed, I completed the course and it had, had no problems. The, the, the assignments were coming through, and they were basically coming through, this class was going overseas, this class would remain stateside. Overseas, stateside overseas, my class, stateside. We already had two orders come through. One was going to the Starcom uh, Com Center out in uh, Kansas City, Missouri. Great tour of duty, wonderful civilian status. You worked, you worked at a comm center out there, great. The other one came through. He was going to the Toby Hanna Army De Depot up in the Poconos up in uh, Pennsylvania. So the orders came through and he said, well, it looks like it's following right on course we're going to be staying stateside. I was kind of disappointed because actually I wanted to try to get to Europe. And I thought, you know, that would, that's another great thing with, with the service. You do sure. get to see some places. So the, um, but what had happened was we got, everybody got called back. Their orders got denied. And here comes a sheet of paper. I just love it. You know, a piece of 20 pound bond off a mimeo, mimeograph machine that's telling you what your future is going to be. So anyway, we had orders. Everybody, the whole class was sent over to Vietnam, except for two. We had one go to, I think he went to the Stockholm area in, Pan in Panama, and the other one went to a Stockholm in, in, uh, in Korea. Now, 1963, mm -hmm. as I recall, was really before major uh, American involvement, at least from a, from a direct a ground combat standpoint, uh, had in, had happened, so it was really uh, an advisory role. Right. Explain what, what uh, your Signal Corps units were doing. Okay. <clears throat> I was sent to Vietnam. We ended up landing in Tan Sanut, where just about everybody landed at that time, and became part of the 39th Signal Battalion. The 39th Signal Battalion was actually formed to go to Vietnam. It consisted of the 232nd Signal Company, which came out of Fort Huachuca, Arizona, the 178th Signal Company, which came from Fort Sam Houston in Texas, the 362nd Signal Company, which came from Fort Gordon, Georgia, along with the Headquarters Headquarters Detachment. So that group was then formed, became the 39th Signal Battalion, and in February of 1962, they were sent into Vietnam. Now, the one thing about the Signal Corps is usually they're like the first ones in, so they were the, the first signal group to go in there. And what their mission was, was to provide installation, operation, and maintenance of the backbone signal system in Vietnam. Cryptographic, the cryptographic equipment provided the secured communications by way of teletype through South Vietnam. They also handled the telephones, the radios, the voice, tropospheric scatter. And the 39th signal at that time was the only signal battalion that was in Vietnam. We actually did it all. And if it's unbelievable, if you could see, I mean, we were probably about 750, maybe 800 troops over there. And when the war escalated, like you said, okay, the signal, the signal groups ended up being about 23,000 soldiers. That's so a as lot you can of, see, that's, that's a, a lot, lot, of, lot of guys. There's a lot of signal companies. Now, you, you mentioned cryptographic in, right. in, in your, your explanation. Uh, there's a lot of uh, secretive stuff. You said you had to get a secret clearance. Correct. I'm sure there are some people who went on to get top secret crypto. I and, did. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Yeah. And uh, so you were involved with some super sleuth type of activities, at least from a communication standpoint. Right. It, it, it was. The, I mean, the crypto machines, a lot of the stuff that we were working with were actually based on the old Enigma machine, the old German Enigma machines. And the... Um, 
but they were, these were all, they were basically offline machines. The machines that we had were basically online. So in other words, we had machines that we could talk by way of teletype and tropospheric scatter all the way across the country. So they would beam, they would beam the signal, the signal would come in, actually uh, come in to uh, relay stations and it would be relayed down to Saigon over at MACV. When we got into Vietnam, there was actually five teams over there at that time. Where were they located? Uh, let me show you. I, got, I have to have a map here. You know, let me, let me bring this out a little bit. Okay, so way at the beginning, th this, is, this is Vietnam. So this is south of Vietnam right here. This is the area that we occupied. It's a, uh, definitely is a, um, you know, jungle atmosphere over there. It's a very beautiful country. Um, well, I would certainly recommend anybody that wanted to take a, 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 a vacation, I, I would definitely go there. But any, um, the five teams came in. We came into Tan Sinu, which is uh, out, just outside of Saigon. And from there, the five teams, they deployed us. We had one of the, one of the repairmen, one of my buddies, he went down to Canto, which is down in the Mekong Delta. Another individual, uh, Griff, he stayed up at MACV headquarters, which is the headquarters of General uh, Stillwell. And then uh, Donald Stanfield, he went up to Natrang. And uh, another buddy, um, Davenport, went up to Quinion. And Lucas went up to... Oh, way up to Da Nang. Da Nang. Up father, yeah. Right, he was up there. The, most of the Marines were up in this area, up in here. But, uh, but uh, that's where they went to. As for me, I did get to do a little bit. Most of them, uh, for their whole tour of duty, they kind of stayed where they were. They stayed at those comm centers. I was kind of the roving guy. I ended up being working down at distribution headquarters in, in Saigon. That was where we, we actually performed fourth echelon maintenance. We could repair down to the component level on the machines. And then, uh, and then while I was there, I was about probably towards the end of June. We, well, we were also allowed to live in a hotel. We lived in, actually lived in a hotel in downtown Saigon, which was extremely nice. The food was absolutely terrific and uh, everything was great. So I didn't really have it too tough. I was never out in a foxhole. So, but from there, um, I, uh, I got orders then uh, to fly up to Play Coup, which is up in, the, up in the Central Highland area of Vietnam. And for there, I was assigned to um, put in a communication uh, um, center, a joint effort between the Army and the Air Force. So I would handle all the crypto installations. I wasn't there very long. I was only there for about 10 days, and I got notice that said, uh, pack your bags, you're going temporary duty down to Natrang. And I said, okay, and they said, well, and you know, they gave me an explanation. They said, Don Stanfield, his wife is giving, giving birth, and they don't think she's gonna live. So what they did is they put him on a plane immediately and they flew him back to the United States. So I came down here and covered Natrang. So my, my area of coverage for, was the comm center at Natrang, offline signals, uh, offline equipment over in Delat, and over in uh, Bami Tuat. They originally started out with offline, offline equipment and I did an installation over in Bami Tuat and we brought them online. Um, my friend, another friend of mine, Krolicky, they brought him and put him up in play coup to replace me once the, once the installation w was installed. You know, it's very interesting. You talk about how the, uh, uh, the coverage of uh, South Vietnam in 1963 with the introduction of a backbone of communications. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly, the plans, uh, which we didn't know back here in the States at the time, was a major infusion of uh, U.S. troops to be supported by these uh, comm centers. Right, yeah. and, and, you know, and you could just see how the, the, the comm centers, I mean, they grew. I mean, I, I imagine there was probably more comm centers throughout the country, but originally there was the original five teams uh, that, that went in there. Um, after completing, I completed, I stayed about six months up in, up in, up in the Trang and got replaced up there. And what they did is they brought me back down to uh, what they call the distribution center where I got back into the depot again and uh, to repair the machines. All the, mach all the machines that needed, needed higher maintenance uh, got brought back down in, into Saigon and we, we actually performed the maintenance on them and sent them back out into the fields again. One of the inter interesting things while I was at, at Natrang was that uh, the special forces, special forces was a separate entity. We weren't supposed to touch their equipment. We weren't supposed to do anything with it. 
But, you know, I, you know the guys, and when you get there, you, you know them. So we would go down, the teletype repairman and myself, we would go down to the Special Forces Comm Center. They had a little comm center. They weren't online. They had all off-line off equipment. But I would go in there, and I'd sneak the, sneak the things out from, uh, from my, my supply depot, and I would go down there, and I would fix up their equipment. Uh, a, little, a little later on in my enlistment, that became very beneficial to me. So, um, That's right. If you need stuff, you want to go to 5th uh, Special Forces headquarters because they had everything. No, well, they, well, they didn't. Actually, they, they, they were, but they were, they, were like a, they were like a fighting group. They, they, they didn't, yeah. you know, it, they, they didn't have very... tubes. They didn't have, uh, they didn't have motor brushes. There was a lot of stuff they just didn't yeah. have, you know, that we had. So what we would do is I would go in and make a few adjustments. Oh, they'd, be, they'd be just be so thankful, you know. But anyway, um, well, after, after, the, after the Natrang duty, returned back to Saigon, spent about two more months in Saigon, and departed. I did, actually departed uh, Vietnam in March of uh, 1964. While you were in Saigon, uh, uh, President Jim was uh, assassinated, oh, yes. wasn't he? Uh, yes. At that point I wasn't in, time? in Saigon at the time. At the yep. time, I was up at Natrang. Exactly. And oh my, I'll never forget that. They had the, uh, yeah, and, and my, the fellow that I replaced, Stanfield, he was back, he, he got his, everything turned out great. The baby was born fine, his wife lived, everything was fine. And he, they returned him back. They left me at Natrang and they put him back, at the, put him back at, the, at the depot. But he was living at the Plaza Hotel. And um, then when they, when they overthrew Diem, of course, because it was, only, it was a military coup that came in and they overthrew him. So they used to have these, uh, the, the Vietnamese, they had these, I think they were two T-38 fighter planes. I don't know if you remember the old, they were, they were sure. propeller driven. And they were almost like World War II planes, but they were fixed, they had them fixed with the, with the 50 calibers out on the wings, you know. And I think they also had some rockets on them too. But anyway, they, um, they had them fixed. And this plane came in and it strafing the palace with the, with the 50s and, he, and this fellow, this pilot, I don't know what was the matter with him. He didn't take his finger off. He didn't take his finger off the trigger, and he decides to fly up and con con continues strafing the Plaza Hotel, which is full of Americans. So you know, you kind of had to watch your back a lot while you were over there. Let me tell you. <laughs> so anyway. Well, that was a, uh, certainly a very tumultuous time because at the about the same time, of course, we had the assassination of our president, and uh, exactly. it was really. Oh. Uh, you know, you were there at a harbinger of, uh, of greater things from a military standpoint uh, about to occur in Vietnam. Yeah, they came over. They came into the, uh, we were over there. Kennedy, uh, President Kennedy was shot. And they came in and they woke me up and they said, uh, they, they said, your boy's been killed. And I thought, you know, and I, I used to have a little, little friend of mine when I was in the train, a little, little young fellow. He was probably about the first or second grade, but, you know, he was real good. You know, you buy him a candy bar and stuff like that. He was great. He would stand up for me. He would speak Vietnamese, you know. They never got away with anything. I had this little fellow. <laughs> so anyway, I thought, well, that was the first thing that went through my mind. Petey got killed? They said, no, President Kennedy. I says, oh, well, that <laughs> didn't seem so bad. I hate to tell you, but... I was really, really worried about Pete. So anyway, uh, yeah, and, and what that brought back, that brought back the memories of, remember in Korea, China came over the wall? That's right. Right, and that brought back memories because Diem got overthrown, Kennedy gets killed, gets assassinated, and boom, we go on major alert. I mean, we were, out, we were outside, we were digging foxholes, we were just, you know, everything that we could barricade up, it just became total chaos. Like, people, they didn't really know what to do, you know? But um, I guess as it turned out, things kind of wound down, and then um, off, uh, you know, off we went back to our thing. But then I got, like I say, in the middle of January, I got transferred down to Saigon and left, left Vietnam. Yeah. They let me out a week early because I didn't get any R&R. &R. They said, oh, no, you got a critical MOS. You can't take any rest and recreation. You have to stay here. So that was five days I missed. I could have gone to Hong Kong or I could have gone to Bangkok. But, uh, no, critical MOS, sorry, you, you can't go. I said, okay. But at so the end, they gave after, me. So where did you go after you left Vietnam? Well, I left Vietnam. I, I, went, I, was, I was scheduled to go to Fort Gordon, Georgia, and uh, work, work at, a, at a depot down there. 
I really didn't uh, want to go to Fort Gordon, so when, when coming back, I, w I was with an uh, Army intelligence uh, officer. He was with ASA, Army Security Agency. And we were talking about it, and I said, you know, I really didn't want to go there. And he says, look, why don't you go down to OPO with Pentagon? OPO? Says, OPO, Office of Personnel Operations. So I said, okay. So on my way down to Gordon, it's, it's on my way. I went down. I went into the Pentagon. Here I am, Spec 4, Remillard, coming from Vietnam. I got in there. I'll never forget it. This guy comes out. He's crying his eyes out. His tears are flying everywhere. His mother's dying. His girlfriend's leaving him. And oh, gee, of course, this poor secretary, she's probably seen this a million times. She's sitting there like, oh, here's another one, you know. <laughs> and so, and I said to myself, oh my, and I'm here just because I don't want to go to Fort Gordon, Georgia. I, saw, I, felt, I felt about that big. So anyway, she says, you're next. So I go inside, Sergeant Major, I, I forget what his name is, the gruffest speaking, shortest little guy, smoking a cigar. And he says, what's your beef, soldier? I says, oh, Sergeant Major, I, says, I don't have any beef. I says, I just didn't. Uh, I just said, if, if there was another, you know, I was stuttering all over the place, you know. And he says, I just said, if there's another assignment, you know, where they could use me, I would prefer to go there rather than go to Fort Gordon, Georgia. And he looks at me like I was totally crazy. And I says, he says, where are you coming from? <laughs> I says, Vietnam. Where you want to go? I says, first army area. Well, sit down. The Northeast, right? Yeah, back yeah. to the Northeast. Right. So anyway, at that time, I didn't have a top secret crypto access. He says, uh, so he says, so what he did, he sent me back to the uh, Fort Monmouth. Gave me three days to get there, which was very, very kind of him. <laughs> but anyway, I went back to the Fort Monmouth and, I, and uh, was assigned to the 595th Signal Company. Uh, the 595th Signal Company, what they basically, their responsibility was, is they were the signal communications for the 82nd Airborne. So once I get back there, I'll tell you a funny story. I'll never forget, forget this. I got back there, and it was just the time the Army was changing over from block caps to, to uh, baseball caps. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't have a block cap. I got to Monmouth. I couldn't, I couldn't buy a block cap. I couldn't find a block cap anywhere. I fell out into formation. The field first, after he gave me two chances, he says, after that, he says, he calls me in. He says, you're going in to see the captain. So into the orderly room I go to see the captain. And the captain finally says, uh, Sergeant, he, he tells him what the thing is. I figured I'm going to get an Article 15 for being out of uniform. So the captain, Captain Eberly was his name, and he says, come on in, sit in my office. So I went into his office. He says, sit down. And he says, between you and me, I says, I got the clearance, sir. I know I was cleared. He says, between you and me, he says, I'm going to be taking over your old outfit. He says, I've been promoted to major and I'm going to become battalion commander of the 39th Signal. He says, sit down and tell me a little bit about it. Hmm. So I sat down. I told him a little bit about it, you know, and we, we talked probably, I don't know, for, we just had an informal chat like we're having now. Got up, went outside. He told the field first that, I don't know what it was, going to be next week or the next couple days. He says, everybody's to fall out with baseball caps. So anyway, I didn't have any problem because you could, I, I had baseball cap. You could buy the baseball caps. So I think we were one of the first signal outfits to ever, uh, <laughs> ever, ever go to the baseball caps. So, uh, well, you left the service in, in what, in uh, 1963? 1965. 65. Got out of February, yeah, yeah, actually. And came back up, up here. How, came how'd back. You, how'd went, you wind up in Hopkinton? Uh, well, I went back home, and, and, and actually uh, I just kind of uh, I had a little bit of difficulty trying to find a job. I thought I'd get a job right away. Crypto repairmen were, uh, did have... Uh, the actual areas where they, where they were useful was uh, a lot of the oil companies used them because a lot of their transmissions, or a lot of large companies, their transmissions would actually, would actually be coded. So there, there, there was uh, positions for them. They would advertise in the Stars and Stripes. But at the time when I got out, there was actually no openings. So I took a job with a company called Lehigh Design up in Waltham, Waltham Mass. I ended up being uh, electronic tech. And um, my first assignment was uh, to IBM up in Endicott, New York. I worked up there for about, went on assignment up there for about 13 months, working in the automation department, enjoyed the job very much. Left there, from there I went to um, Foxborough Company, worked in their test department. While there, that was when I met my wife, Georgiana, and then uh, I figured, well, I better take a full-time job, uh, more permanent. So I went to work for Honeywell, from Honeywell, I went to Intel. From Intel, I went to Digital. From Digital, I went to um, Cambridge Memories. From Cambridge Memories to Prime Computer. 
And from Prime Computer, after that, after they closed the doors, I was laid off, and I, uh, I went and I bought a printing business, printing copying business, and we've been doing that. My wife and I have been doing that now for over 23 years. Well, there's certainly a, a great story there about uh, the educational benefits to uh, military service. A lot of people don't recognize that. Right. Uh, you go back to uh, 1962, you were hoping to go to RIT, and you wound up uh, going to the School of Hard Knocks with the Signal Corps in the Army. Right. And uh, it puts you in pretty good stead for a technical career after your service. Absolutely. I and, think that's, and, the, uh, and just the, what my experience in the Signal Corps uh, was actually uh, worth uh, uh, first two years, two years of college at the University of Maryland. Although that was in the University of Maryland, I didn't. I came back. I went to school. I went to school uh, nights uh, to become an engineer, uh, working at at uh, Northeastern. Mm -hmm. And while I was at Nor while I was working at at Honeywell and going to school at Northeastern, Intel made me an offer. They said, "Why don't you come to work for us, and we'll make you an engineer?" So I said, "That was it." So we ended up moving to California. Well, Ron, uh, I really thank you for coming in and sharing your experiences. And I'd like to thank you for joining us in this episode of Veterans Remember. And I also want to thank Ron for sharing his experiences in the Army. Veterans Remember is a series of conversations with Hopkinton veterans who have served their country during wartime and peace. They have personally helped to preserve our freedom and have made numerous contributions to the town of Hopkinton. I am Dick Gooding, your host, and I thank you for joining us today on Veterans Remember. A pediatrician. Uh, I was hoping to become a chef someday. As long as there's somebody behind you pushing you and supporting you, then you feel that you always have the strength to keep going. So get involved and do your part. Invest in the future. Mentor a child.